uh, the last time we were together, we talked about um, in part the prophets, and one of the uh, things we talk about is uh, how to read the prophets as enforcers of the covenant, uh, the covenant that God struck with um, the Israelites at Horeb, and that becomes the blueprint for the prophets to talk about whether Israel had been faithful to the covenant and if it is before the exile and Israel had not been faithful to the covenant, then the prophets will warn them that uh, God will punish them because God is a faithful God, he's faithful to the covenant. And so he will unleash the covenantal curses on the Israelites if they do not repent. Um, but because God will also heal them, uh, so he, so the prophets will always kind of have a positive outlook at the very end. That if if Israel repent, uh, I wonder they will repent, and God will bring them back to the land, uh, so on and so forth. And then there will be a new hope and a uh, and a new future. And if it is after the the exile, usually the prophecy will be about um, the one day God will bring in a new golden age for Israel, right? So that that is roughly how the prophets work. Less of foretelling what's going to happen, um, but more of foretelling. Uh, the word of God, uh, according to the covenant that they have made. So, um, in that context, I have requested that you study the book of Habakkuk, uh, very short three chapters, just two pages on my Bible, uh, and to see what learnings did you glean from the book of uh, Habakkuk. Uh, anyone want to share? Uh, so I think you have to unmute. I'll start. Okay. Following your format. Following the format. Let me just show them the the format. Give me a second to to get it uh loaded up. Give me a second, huh? Mm. Okay, there you go. Okay. Um the historical timeline, um, it was after the Assyrians had um, captured the Northern Kingdom and uh, Habakkuk was uh, lived roughly before the Babylonians uh, captured the Southern Kingdom. What is the central message of Habakkuk? Um, the central message um, actually is both for the Northern Kingdom uh, Israelites as well as uh, the Southern Kingdom. The uh, that means uh, Judah in Judah. Um, the message actually uh, it is. Uh, from the conversation that Habakkuk had with God, that uh, he struggled with, um, uh, first of all, the, the sin of uh, the people in Judah. and But then when he realized that God is going to send the Babylonians uh, to judge and to uh, attack uh, Judah, he struggled with that because uh, to him, they were uh, 
worse off, uh, they were more sinful than the Israelites. Um, so what is the central message is uh, in the conclusion that God, he, he concluded that God is sovereign. It is not, um, uh, he has his way of um, uh, judgment and it is very much up, up to God. But uh, the central message is uh, the righteous shall live by faith. It is, uh, we cannot say that, the, you know, there are some people who still uh, follow God, believe in God and trusted God, but we cannot call them righteous. The righteous, um, it's uh, to him, the righteous should wait patiently for God and trust in God that, uh, especially the last uh, few uh, verses of chapter 3, uh, that's how the, the posture of the writers should be. So it is also a message to the original audience who heard his oracles. Hmm. Do I continue? Yeah, yeah. Uh, or or uh, maybe someone wants to jump in? Anyone wants to jump in on uh, Abakup? Um, God also said that he will judge the Babylonians. It's not that uh, he uses them to judge Israel or, or his chosen people, but they themselves will later be judged. Mm. So um, perhaps that was some comfort to Habakkuk. I don't know. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to add that bit. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that contribution. That's important. That God will judge the the Babylonians. The, yeah, can we continue, Sansim, I think? How did the New Testament apply Habakkuk's message? It's mentioned in three places. In Romans uh, 1, verse 17, I think. Galatians 3, 11, and Ephesians 2, 8. It says that the righteous shall live by faith. The righteous referring to believers in the Lord Jesus. The righteous shall live by faith. That's what we should be doing. We should wait patiently um, for God to act, to trust in God. Because as believers in the Lord Jesus, he has considered us righteous and that should be our posture. How, Whatever circumstances you are going through, however evil how, uh, that surrounds us, we know that God will, God is sovereign and he will act. Our part is to wait patiently, to trust in God, that He will do what is just and right. Hmm. Are there the other two references? Um, the, the other two reference Galatians 3, 11 and Ephesians 2, that salvation belongs to the Lord mm. uh, tr uh, by grace and through faith. Ah, so you think that the by faith through grace, through, uh, uh, by grace through faith is an allusion to uh, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4 the righteous shall live by faith. Yeah, there's also the one in Hebrews. Then verse 38. Mm. Uh, William, you want to help us with? Yeah, I mean, there's one uh, from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. It says, but my righteous ones, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if anyone does not see how to do it, there will be peace with him. But never mind. This is to 
to emphasize lah that we need to uh, we can only uh, be righteous through faith in God and of course Christ Jesus lah mm. and of course uh, this perseverance in faith requires a uh, commitment and obedience to God's will okay mm. yeah. so this yeah. one has a lot more to do with faithfulness right not just faith but mm. uh, faithfulness that the righteous shall live by being faithful yeah mm -mm. perseverance in, in mm. the faith yeah so this strange book uh, like little red book Habakkuk how should we read Habakkuk today? Just respond a little, lah. Uh. Mm. I mean, just like us today, uh, like Habakkuk. I mean, Habakkuk have questions, and he asked God, you know, why, why are evil, uh, happening? Why are people uh, disobeying God? Why are they, uh, as if that they can be evil and they can get scot free, but mm. God say no, uh, that ultimately uh, there will be judgment upon them. Uh, it is only those. Who, who persevere in faith, they will triumph uh, and mm. the Lord will see to their faith uh, being rewarded and secured in Him. Lah. Okay. So there are things we don't understand too, but we must continue to trust in God's sovereignty over all things lah, and He will bring to pass as He has promised in His word lah, one day. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else has any Contribution for Habakkuk. Yes, Gabi. For us, for us, I think, uh, while we live by faith, I think we need to cry out to like Habakkuk, mm. in wrath, remember mercy. Um, because we are all sinners, we are all sinners, and deserve God's judgment. Mm. And 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 we all. And we all need his mercy to survive. Yeah. Grace. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can I just jump yeah. to you? Please go ahead. Sorry. Go uh, ahead. I, I didn't do the homework, but um, I read Habakkuk uh recently in my BSF studies. Huh? Um, one thing that jumped up to me is in chapter 3, verse the second part of verse 16. Yet I will wait patiently. Mm. Notwithstanding the fact that the beginning of the chapter, Habakkuk's uh, complaint to God was, how long, O Lord, must I call for help? Mm. And yet, after the uh, discourse with, with God, um, Habakkuk said that, I will wait patiently. Mm. And this is uh, it shows uh, Habakkuk's uh, commitment in mm. in God. What was he waiting for? Uh, I will wait very patiently for the day of calamity to come <laughs> yeah. on the nation invading us. I mean, he was waiting for God's judgment on Babylon. No, but he Assyria is he not? No, not neither. Right. Oh yeah, no. verse sixteen, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, the Babylonians. Yeah. Yeah. That means he is looking forward to the end of the exile. Right? And you can see mm. how yeah, yeah, and you can and the, the fall of Babylon, right? The fall of Babylon mm. who persecutes us and when so salvation will ultimately come when, when judgment comes upon Babylon, right? And you can see how this might have influenced the thinking of the apostles who were living under the Roman Empire. And so the book of Revelation foretells the fall of Babylon the Great, which will bring about the restoration of a new Jerusalem. Right, you know, you know what I mean. So, 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 therefore, our so therefore, the righteous shall live by faith. <laughs> uh, wait for the day where God will uh finally pour out uh judgment upon Babylon the Great, uh, thus bringing the end to 
our time as exiles and surgeons, uh, sojourners on the earth and ushering in the new Jerusalem, a new heaven and a new earth. So uh, we can see how Habakkuk has a continuous application, uh, both for people of his time, for the apostles in the light of Christ, and for us today as we wait for uh, a new Jeru a new Jerusalem. Yeah. Just as Habakkuk looking was looking really far. Yeah, yeah, looking really far. <laughs> this this looks really, really, really far. <clears throat> and what will be the goal of all this? The goal of another key verse will be chapter 2, verse 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And then in verse 20, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. So the goal of all these tumultuous times, the vicissitudes of life, the rise and fall of power and empires, and all the um, calamities uh, will, by faith, we know that we'll end up with the earth being filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So therefore, in our daily life, when we look at the situation around us, and we do often want to cry out, Oh Lord, how long? How long shall I cry for help? You will not hear Cry to you violence and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you idly look at wrong? And you see the law is paralyzed. Everything is, is God really in control? And, and, and the answer is yes. But I don't see it. Well, you shall live by faith. Uh, and believe that one day God will, will bring about the downfall of evil. Uh and all represented by Babylon the Great, and that one day the, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. So so, so we await. We quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who, who invade us. But meanwhile, though the fig tree should not blossom, though the, nor the fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there will be and there be no herd in the stalls. So this is just terrible. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Because, because you see the bigger picture. If you do not see the bigger picture, if you miss the forest for the trees, if you're just focusing on your life, like how terrible things are, how sinful. Uh, you are on your family, on the on your company, on your country, on your then while well, the fig tree doesn't blossom, the fruit is on the vine, the produce of the olive fail, the fields you no food, and what is going on? You will not rejoice. But if you see the bigger picture that all this is part and parcel, uh part of that part of that um part part of that um, labor pangs, uh, labor pangs to bring about new creation, then you will rejoice in the Lord. You will take joy in the God of your salvation amidst the, the, the terrible times. God, the Lord is my strength. He made, he makes my feet like the deers. He make me tread on my high places. So uh, that would be the prophet's response to the guarantee by God that his own country will be destroyed. So in whose country? Israel. Will be destroyed or not destroyed? Will Sorry. be destroyed. Oh dear. Yeah, that is what it's about. So the first complaint, he complained. So, yeah. so, so this is his first complaint is, God, bad things are going on in the country. Your law is being paralyzed. The Torah is not being... Why don't you do something about it? And God said, yeah, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to send the Babylonians to destroy all of you. That's me doing something about it. And then the prophet like, what? <laughs> and then he lodges a second complaint. Like, how can you let someone more evil than us to destroy us? The Babylonians are worse than us. 
And then God's second answer is, don't you worry about the Babylonians, I'll destroy them too. So first I'll destroy you with the baby the, by the Babylonians, and then I'll destroy the Babylonians, and then everyone will know that I'm the Lord. And then Habakkuk said, okay, that's good enough for me. So it is it is a rough message, but then if you see uh what is important, then you will be able to rejoice in the Lord. Um they can join the God of our salvation just as Habakkuk did. The righteous shall live by faith. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Let's get to um today's uh session. We are now reading Psalms and Proverbs. I will spend more time in Psalms uh instead of in in Proverbs. Um So Psalms and Wisdom, or not just Proverbs, the whole uh, Wisdom Corpus. And then um, uh, the week after, we will do Revelation and then some conclusion. Now, uh, if you would go to um, the book of Psalms, you just scroll very quickly to the book of Psalms, and you will see on Psalm 1, uh, the the psalms doesn't start with someone. The psalms start with one interesting heading that is above chapter one, verse one that you may have, and it is called book one, right? Book one, and then what you need to do is to okay, that's book one, and you want to browse to the end of book one to find book two, and so as you flip over the pages, you will find the heading book two on top of Psalm 42. All right. Do you have that? I hope you do. Huh? So book one is, is Psalm 1 to Psalm 41. And then you see book two on top of Psalm 42. And if you go to the end of <clears throat> Psalm 41, right at the end of book one, you will have this phrase, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen, right? Or praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel from everlasting to ever everlasting. Amen and amen. So this verse is known as a bookmark verse. The bookmark verse is not part of Psalm 41 originally. Um, Psalm 41 ends in verse 12. Uh, and Psalm 41 verse 13, this verse is actually a bookmark verse to indicate the end of book one. Uh, people who don't understand this will, and I, I, and I have heard of people preaching in such a way, whereby they will preach that Psalm and then they will also preach the 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 bookmark as the end or as the ending of that that psalm that is not correct the psalm ends in verse 12 but you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever that ends that psalm and then the bookmark verse blessed be the lord the god of israel from everlasting to everlasting amen and amen that indicates the end of the book and then we have book two from Psalm 42. And then if you go all the way to the end of Psalm 20, uh, Psalm 72, which is a Psalm of Solomon. And then you look at Psalm 73, it says book three. Therefore, uh, book two is from Psalms 42 through 72. And here there is a uh, long bookmark ending, which is verse 18 and 19, which is uh, praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. 
which means that verse 18 and 19 are not part of Psalm 72 proper, which is that Psalm of Solomon that ends in verse 17. So that Psalm of Solomon begins with, Give the king your justice, O God, and ends with verse 17, May his name endure forever, his fame continue as long as the sun. May people be blessed in him. All nations call him blessed. Right? So that's how that psalm ends. And then the compiler. Uh, so I think to contextualize, this is <clears throat> imagine we're writing, a, 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 we're compiling a hymnal, right? So our hymnal, sing hymnal. So we got hymns from Charles Wesley, we got hymns from Horatius Bona, we got hymns from uh, many, from uh, various hymn writers. And uh, uh, Benny Kong likes to mark the end of every section of the hymnal with a little prayer. And so after um, listing song number 72, uh, of a particular author. And then Benny scribbles at the end, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things, or praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Uh, and and after a while, people forgot, and he and he made sure that it is in a different typography uh, so that you know that it is by the editor, by the compiler. Uh, but eventually we lost that distinction. And so that is the way. <clears throat> so we, we read it as though it is part of Psalm 72. It is not. And then there is an, another colophon <clears throat> at the end, um, verse 20. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. And you see that the next psalm is a psalm of Asa from Book 3. Now, if you look at... <clears throat> All the psalms before that, right? Uh, uh, Psalm 51, 52, 53, 66, all, all the way through are mostly psalms of some of a psalm of David, right? Mostly psalms of David. <coughs> um therefore, book one and book two mostly are psalms of David. And here we have this concludes the prayers of David, son of Jesse, which means that. Um, this was the extent of the original hymn book, if you, if you would say. And then after a while, we published supplements, right? And 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 so book three begins a supplement, um, which is from Psalm seventy three to Psalm eighty nine. So if you go to Psalm seventy three, you see the heading book three. And then when you turn to Psalm 89, a long psalm of Ethan, a mashkil, and then you go to the end of Psalm 89, and that is Psalm 89 verse 52, you see another bookmark, this time relatively short. Praise be to the Lord forever. Amen and amen. Right? There will always be this amen and amen. And then that ends book three. And then the next section is book four, another supplement. Uh, book four is from Psalm 90 to Psalm 106. Uh, and Psalm 106, there is a bookmark at uh, 48, verse 48. Blessed, uh, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, and then 107 to 150 begins um, book five. Now, I'm just going to take a pause here to make sure you, you, you can follow. I just want to take a look at, does anyone have any questions with, can you follow? Is this new to anybody? <clears throat> that the, the Psalms have five books. You, you already know this, huh? You didn't know this, Liz? <laughs> so, 
so the so the the Psalter, we call it the Psalms, the the Book of Psalms is actually a composition, a a, a compilation of it are actually five different compilations. Okay, and since there are five different compilations, it kind of makes sense if they were written in different times. And as as new songs get added, we as new songs get written, uh. <clears throat> Then we compile, right? You know, you know what I mean. So, so I'll sing him book. You know what I mean. Now Benny and his team are working on on a on on a supplement to the sing him book to take into consideration the songs that have been written since the time of the release of the sing him book. I think it's two thousand and thirteen or something like that. Two thousand twelve, two thousand thirteen, and so there have been like. 10, 11 years of Christian music since then. And, and, and so we maybe we want to put together a, a supplement. So you can imagine that um, the bulk of book one will have, will have come first. And it and and the hymn that and that and that hymnal, the original hymnal, um probably Psalm 2 or Psalm 3, Psalm 3 to Psalm 41. Would be the original hymn book, praise be to the Lord, the God of, and then and then at the end of the hymnal, the 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 editor of the hymnal put in the line, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, Amen and Amen. And maybe after this, David wrote more psalms, right? And since David wrote more psalms, they they put together a a second compilation called Book Two, which are primarily Psalms of David and ended with a Psalm of Solomon. So perhaps it is compiled shortly after the death of David and Solomon wanted to compile a second volume after his father's death, collecting more songs, more um, Psalms his father written. And he wrote one uh, to, to end, to, to, he, he wrote one, Okay, and put it as Psalm seventy two, to to kind of kind of like conclude, um, the Davidic Psalms. So then there is a long, <clears throat> um, long book end to to show that the work has completed. Right, or we have now compiled the Psalms of David, um, and then there is a. This concludes the prayers of David, son of Jesse. Um, not sure if this was added <clears throat> um, by Solomon or, or later, that's hard to say. But we do have, I suppose, for a longest time, book one and book two, uh, Psalms 3 to 72, at least for a start. That would be Israel's prayer book, uh, temple book, hymn book, worship book during the kingdom period. And then book three is very sad. Uh, book three ends with why has God abandoned us uh, kind of a thing. Okay. Uh, a, a, sum of, a sum of Asaf. So, and then the ending of book three is very muted. 89 verse 52, which is the sh a very short um message, a very short book end. Praise be to the Lord forever. Amen and amen. Uh, and basically 73 to 89 is just mostly crying. And and then book four looks more uplifting. Okay, looks more uplifting. And we have this praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Let all the people say Amen. Praise the Lord. And then we have book five after that. So um, um, scholars may say that um, it does look like book one and book two are mostly pre-exilic. Um, probably except for Psalm one and two uh, that serves as an introduction to the, to the whole Psalm, Psalm three to 72. Probably mostly exilic, pre-exilic, written by uh, David. And then 73 to 89 
are compiled during the exile. Uh, that is very likely. That is why, I'm sorry, it has such dark tone to 73 to 89. Uh, so they're in exile. And maybe book four and book five were written uh, after the uh, exile, uh, compiled after the exile. So one of the interesting thing is that it's a because this is a scroll. Uh, for us, our hymnal is in the form of a book, right? Our hymnal is in the form of a book, and so if we if we like to add in anything, we just maybe add in into the to the middle here. But even if we add into the middle, then the number will larry, right? So it is not easy to 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 add to to a book. Um, but what they have is a scroll, a scroll, a scroll, right? So therefore, and if many people have that scroll because we copy it many volumes, you can't just say, let's add a something in the middle. Even the right, add a new song, right? You can't just add to the middle. So what you, if you're going to add anything, uh, you will need to add it at the seams, at the seams, right? So, um, the book you can add either to the front or to the back. Say, let's just say we now have book one and book two. You want to do a book three, okay? Then you can maybe add things to book two at the end of book two, or you can add things to the top of book one. You cannot add anything in between because this this is already established. Does that mean? Does that make sense? Then you add in the book three, and then what? Well, then you have book one, two, and three. Once you have book one, two, and three, and then if you want to do any more additions, say you want to add a book four, then you can either uh, add to the end of book four, uh, add a, at the end, at the end of book three, or add, add some more at the start of book one, or something like that. What you cannot do is to mess up what is already established in between. So therefore, Scholars study a lot on the psalms at the seams, okay, to read along the seams to see, to look for clues, whether things have been, uh, what, what is the history of the development of the hymn book. My point then is that there is a history to the development of the hymn book. It isn't just all 150 psalms all written in one day. Of course, that is ridiculous. Uh, when you read the psalms of David, Many of the Psalms of David will tell you exactly uh, what occasion uh, David had, might have written that, that Psalm, right? Uh, one Psalm is when he was running away from Absalom. Another Psalm, uh, he's in a different uh, situation, hiding in the case of Abdullam in the wilderness of Judah or, or whatever the case may be. And some of the Psalms are written by different people, Solomon, Moses, etc. right? And Moses is Psalm 90, which means that either it's written, if it's written by Moses, then it's a Psalm that they have kept for a long time, never made it into the the the, the, the hymnal, and then um, um, the post-exilic compilers decide to, hey, let's add a Psalm of Solomon. Now, whether it's written by Solomon or whether it is like something Solomon would have written or whatever that means, it is it is up for debate. But the point is that the 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 songbook grew with Israel. So knowing where you are, which book you are, will give you some kind of a uh guide to reading it from the perspective of someone before the exile, someone during the exile. Someone after the exile. Does that make sense? That's that that that's the point I'm I'm making, All right? So, um, uh, now I'm just gonna um, and each of the of 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 the book themselves are are very fascinating in its composition. Um, so if you take a look at book five one zero seven to one fifty. It begins with give thanks. I'm um, sorry. It begins with give thanks to the Lord for He is good, and and one one eight at the end. There's another give thanks to the Lord for He is good. So it seems to a lot of people and to me as well that these two psalms are meant to become some kind of some kind of a book. End was possibly the original um scope of book five so when they wanted to add in book five 
uh, probably as temple worship material, uh, a good reason to think that Book 5, uh, way after the rebuilding of the temple, and so they have all these festivals that they want to celebrate and pass over, etc. And there are all these psalms that they, that they, that they do sing uh, for, for festivals. So there's give thanks to the Lord for his good, 107. And so that is kind of like the opening bookmark. And then give thanks to the Lord for he is good. That's kind of like the concluding uh, bookmark. And in between is a collection of uh, more psalms of David that were not, were not included in the previous collections, but now included a couple of uh, um, three Psalms of David. And then we have praise the Lord Psalms and praise the Lord Psalms. All right. It begins with praise the Lord and it ends with praise the Lord. And in between, they want to incorporate some often Psalms. So I think that maybe it's these often Psalms uh, that they really want to add in. So, they have a few praise the Lord Psalms, praise the Lord Psalms, uh, some David Psalms, and then all bracketed by give thanks to the Lord for he is good. And then Psalm 119, the longest psalm, uh, which is uh uh, uh what is known as acrostic psalm, not, not so important. It, it means that everything um uh, for the first eight verses, it all starts with one alphabet and then the next set of verses starts with another alphabet, another set starts another letter, starts another letter. So it's basically the 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 whole section of that of that of that psalm starts with different letters of of the Hebrew. You can, you can read it, right? You go to Psalm 119. So Psalm 119 verse 1 to verse 8 is under Aleph. It means that every verse begins with the letter Aleph, and then verse 9 to verse 16, uh, it's Beth, and everything starts with, with Beth, all right? So uh, I believe that, and uh, actually, who am I? This is the conclusion of scholars that um, that the wisdom psalm, uh, is a wisdom psalm, meditate on the word, is meant to be the original ending, well, or rather, original ending? Yeah original ending of book five uh and it was since it was the original ending of book five it was also at some point meant to be the end of the psalm all right but after that they have more psalms uh because that's how things work right you think that yeah this is it this is the end but then uh, after a while more songs are written right and then you want to capture those so why not book six why why just five books? I mean, if you say that 119 is supposed to be the end of book five, why not push 120 to 150 um into 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 book six? The reason is that uh the, the whole reason of this wisdom psalm to meditate on the word, to meditate on the law of God, the Torah, is because we want to have five books to, to mirror. The idea of we have five books of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And because there are five books of the Torah, so we want to have five books of um of, of the Psalms. Does that make sense? All right. Which is that is why they didn't add book six. They pushed one, two, zero, and one four, five, zero. They added, appended it to book five. Uh the reason why they wanted to have um more psalms after 119 is because they have written these songs of ascents, which is these songs that you sing on the way up to Jerusalem uh, for Passover festival or whatever festival. All right. So there is this collection of uh, 15 psalms that is the songs of ascents, uh, songs that you sing on the way to or back from to, to, to on the way to Jerusalem. And we have a uh, we have a few often psalms, and then we have more psalms of David, and then we have the hal we have the hallelujah psalms one four six to one five zero. These are the hallelujah psalms, uh, which is like we have hallelujah psalms, hallelujah psalm, and then we have hallelujah psalms as well. Um, one reason that gives it away why one one nine was meant to be the original. There are many reasons to think one one nine was the original ending of the sorter is because. One, of course, is that book five, we have 
one zero seven give thanks a lot for his good and then one one nine give thanks a lot for his good and then we we write the super sum right the super sum the sum of all sums kind of thing right one one nine um um is because one one nine mirrors sum one 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 nine says blessed are those whose ways are blameless who walk according to the law of the Lord oh how I love your law I meditate on it all day long that is basically the emphasis of Psalm 119 is just Psalm 119 is just over and over again repeating this burden of the 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 of, of the psalm, which is to meditate on the word of God, meditate on the law of the Lord. Which of course, Psalm 1 begins with Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night, right? Love your law and meditate on it all day long. So you can see that <laughs> these two Psalms are supposed to be bookend of the Psalm of the Sorter, uh, which means that, uh, and if you read, <clears throat> if you go to the Psalms, Psalm 1, for example, you wouldn't see a heading. You wouldn't see a heading. After book 1, then it is immediately, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, stands not in the ways of scoffers, sits, neither sit, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, etc. And then Psalm 2, you also do not see a heading. But Psalm 3 onwards, you begin to see a heading. A Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. Psalm 4 says, to the choir master with string instruments, a Psalm of David. Psalm 5 says, the choir master, to the choir master for the flutes, a Psalm of David. So, um, Psalm 3 onwards, there's this superscription, and they're all mostly Psalms of David. Does that, does that make sense? This is the Davidic compilation, which means Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 <clears throat> are actually introduction. Introduction. Psalm 2 was probably an introduction to the prayers of David, which ends in 72, right? So Psalm 3 to Psalm 72, these are the prayers of David. And at the end of Psalm 72, it's written... Uh, and this concludes the prayers of David, the sons of the son of Jesse. And so Psalm 2 is this royal psalm about, <clears throat> about the king. And so probably Psalm 2 is the introduction to the to the Davidic collection. And then Psalm 1 might have been added by the people who are responsible for book five up to Psalm 119. You know, you know what I mean? So they wanted to conclude the sorter with Psalm 119 and then they added a preface. Someone acts as a preface to the whole sorter like that. All right. So uh, which means that the uh, the people who framed the one of the final touches of the sorter are people who are interested in obeying the law. On keeping the law, and one way to keep the law uh, is to actually meditate on the psalms. You, you meditate on these psalms; it is equivalent to keeping the law of God. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I'm going to take a pause here to see where you are at. Uh, to to see to see where you're at. Any any questions? I know it's a bit. Too much so before I continue. <laughs> uh, I want to see if you have any points or any questions to ask. Uh Stephen. Yeah. How do the sorter, I mean mm, the, the sorter, yeah. Divide the sum into the five. How do they chronologically or thematically or you know? How I mean, how do they divide it into five books? How do they uh, compilers of the sort oh, of how, how, yeah. how to put book one, book two, book three, the sums, you know? Yeah, uh, like I said, book one and book two uh, were probably one unit at some for a long time during the kingdom period. Uh, then new songs were written after that, or old songs were added after that to book three during the exile. And then uh, after they come back from the exile, more songs were written or rediscovered and and that occasioned the need for book four so they added in book four after the exile and then for corporate worship uh um 
after the exile for a lot of corporate worship things. Um, the temple is well rebuilt and, and, and therefore a lot of festivals are being observed, people becoming more pious and the nation grow and prosper. Uh, and so therefore the book five was needed, was needed. So they added book by book as, as, as the history of Israel grows. So basically people would say that the Psalms is a microcosm of the Bible, of, of the Old Testament. The Psalms is a microcosm of the Old Testament because here we have the evidence of a growing songbook, right? That grows together with the history of Israel. Stephen. Yep. Um, this scroll of the Psalms mm. um, would be in the keeping of the Levites and the priests. Would yeah. the ordinary yeah. man have a copy? Uh, probably not. Um, some so synagogue that, might have. Um, so the, the general public, the Israelites will only get to hear it when they go to the temple uh, and then memorize it. Yeah, and I sing that, uh -huh. sing, sing, sing it when you get home. Um, <clears throat> not just that, because it's that few, few and far in between are people who are literate, anyways. Yeah, so they would just hear and keep it in their hearts and their minds. <clears throat> so then, how would they meditate if they don't have the copy in front of them? Hey, you know what? As some of these kids have memorized all of Taylor Swift songs, all, all yeah. of Taylor Swift songs, <laughs> right? Without ever having read the lyrics, the kids have memorized all the Taylor Swift songs. Okay. It's a song. There's it's hard for us okay. now because there's no tune. Back then there was oh. the, there was tune. All right. Okay. I, I get it now. Thanks. Yeah, I'm sure you have you have memorized a lot of songs from the sixties and the seventies without ever having read uh the lyrics, have you? <laughs> right. So the songs, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Much easier to meditate. Mm. Songs, yeah. And, and, but but you, you make an important point. The priests were the ones who, because many of songs, right, go to church to sing, right? So this is a temple, temple property. Okay. So because this is temple property, uh, you can you can you you are you can make the inference that the compilers that put in blessed is the one who meditates on the law, etc., etc., all those things would, would have been the, the priests. Mm -hmm. We are so privileged. Oh uh, yeah, we have all hundred. But they are they they were privileged because they didn't have too much rubbish to fill their minds with. Probably, I mean, so you know, their their minds could just absorb. I'm because... sure you know more way more than hundred fifty songs. Yeah, I think you you know at least eighty hymns. Okay, and uh, another thirty Beatles and another thirty of uh Presley and of, of Elvis and uh, another twenty of uh, Michael Jackson. I suppose I think we 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 do know songs. <laughs> I don't these songs no problem at all. Uh, Jesus Jesus loved to sing the hymn the, the Psalms. He quotes from it a lot. He quotes two two he quotes three things right a lot, which is uh, Deuteronomy Psalms and Isaiah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Now we have to talk about the type of songs. The type of songs. Um, we so we can put them into categories. Um, I'm just giving you some examples. For more, you need to read the book. <laughs> okay. For more, you need to read the book. Uh, uh these, these are lectures based on the book, but uh, it's not a substitute for the book, right? So you have to read the book. Uh, here are the types of psalms. Laments, uh, thanksgiving, praise, salvation history, celebration psalms, wisdom psalms, songs of trust. Um, here are some examples. Uh, laments, uh, there's individual lament and corporate lament. So 
For example, the individual lament of Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from my from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, I find, but I find no rest. All right, so this is a lament. Lament is a complaint song, right? Songs of complaint. And there's a lot of them. Um, I know that our Sunday uh, service, we like to sing uplifting songs, songs of joy, rejoicing. But the Psalms really have a lot of lament Psalms. And I don't know whether anyone likes to write lament Psalms and choose a lament Psalm or lament hymn on a Sunday morning. But uh, lament, I mean, our life is not just all roses. And, and so there's a lot of complaints. And these complaints are all very honest. It's like, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is not, have you forsaken me? It's why have you forsaken me? You know what I mean? It's so raw. Um, and you may say that, but that's not theologically correct. God doesn't forsake. I mean, if you ask, my God, my God, have you forsaken me? Then maybe that's a bit more gentle. It's like, why have you forsaken me? Is that you know that you know for a fact that God has forsaken you. And you're just asking, why have you <laughs> forsaken me? So hey, that doesn't sound theologically correct. Uh, <clears throat> but but David doesn't care. He 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 is not asking a theological question. He is he is pouring out his emotions <clears throat> uh to 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 God, right? It is like <clears throat> a spouse asking, why don't you love me? Actually, that's not the fact. The fact is that of course uh the spouse loves um loves the the person making the complaint, uh, but it is pure <clears throat> passion here. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So this is a lament to complain to God. There is individual lament and there is also corporate lament <clears throat> um, whereby it is the whole congregation uh, that lament, maybe in times of calamity, um, in times of trouble, uh, and they will, and they will um, uh, sing a collective lament. So Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving is <clears throat> after the fact, so lament is complain to God, and thanksgiving is after God saves you from the problem. <laughs> All right, then you want to um give thanks to God. So there's individual thanksgiving and there is corporate um uh, thanksgiving. So an individual thanksgiving uh could be could be could be eight uh eighteen eighteen right sub eighteen. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my, my fortress, and my deliverer. Uh, <clears throat> my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. I am saved from my enemies. See, I am saved from my enemies. So <clears throat> this is after the fact. So lament is to be used while you are in, in the situation. <clears throat> Thanksgiving <clears throat> is when God has delivered you from that situation. <clears throat> and then Psalm 18, um, there is a superscription there. To the choir master, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who addressed the words of this song to the Lord on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. So, so then this invites you to go back to the uh to to second Samuel to to read the first Samuel and second Samuel right to to read uh about David and to meditate on David's situation of being delivered from the hand of Saul <laughs> and then if you have a similar situation um a analogous situation in your life and then when you are in trouble, and then after that you you recover, safe from your enemies, then you can go to the temple and you can offer this Thanksgiving psalm, all right, along with the sacrifices. Um, yeah, you could you could choose to have you could choose to sing this song as you offer the sacrifice. So there's Thanksgiving, there's corporate. So you can see that how these psalms are used in different settings of worship. Um uh, lament is is to be used in your own lives or in the life of the community, 
And for Thanksgiving, it's usually you go to the temple, offer the sacrifice, and then you sing aloud this psalm or you get the choir to sing for you or something like that, right? As a testimony. So there's always a testimony component. Uh, and then there are praise. This is just very uh, gen generic. Generic is not the right term, but praise, I mean, I'll, I'll praise hymns, like praise um, Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. I you have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger, right? So this is, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So that's a praise. And then there's salvation history, which is to a song that teaches the history of Israel, the salvation history of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, um, um, Joshua, Judges. So basically it is to, it is a recounting of history in the, of salvation history in, in, in the form of a song. And there are the various celebration psalms, um, royal psalms. So, for example, when the new king is being enthroned, I believe that Psalm 2 was part of that um, enthroning of a, of, a new, of a new king. Uh, other Psalms as well uh, are probably sung during the uh, Upachara Petabalan of the king of Israel, <laughs> all right, of the um, of the ceremony. Uh, there are other celebration psalms, songs of Zion, probably for um, festivals. There are a lot of festival psalms, uh, songs of ascents, for example, uh, uh, some celebrating going to Jerusalem for, for pilgrimage. Uh, wisdom Psalms. Wisdom Psalms are basically two ways to live. Psalms, Psalm 1, Psalm 36, Psalm 119. All these are wisdom Psalms about the importance of the word of God, about two ways to live. Um, choose God instead of choosing rebellion. Um, uh, do good instead of doing bad. Um, uh, making right decisions. Uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Choose life, not death. That kind of a thing. Wisdom Psalms. Songs of trust. So these are categories of Psalms. Now, which if a Psalm have a category, that means there is a format, right? So if, for example, letters, there are two categories of letters. There is the formal letter and informal letter. And the formal letter will have its format. And then the informal letter will have its format. Uh, the format itself betrays the type of letter that you are writing. So likewise, uh, each of these type of psalms uh, have have particular format to it. All right. So I'll just choose um, lament, individual lament and individual. Uh, I, I, I just, I'll just choose lament and thanksgiving. All right. Lament and thanksgiving. So here is a example. Psalm 3, lament, a psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. Usually, um, while the order may differ from psalm to psalm, but you will have these components uh, usually. There will be an address, addressing God, in, or invocation, if you are into that kind of terminology, uh, invocation, address. And then complain to the person you're addressing to. In this case, God, com make your complaint to God. And then um, show your trust in him. Believe that he will uh, uh, deliver you, okay? Give some assurance and end with a praise. Uh, so, Lord, that's, that's the address. And then here's the complaint. How many are my foes? How, how many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. So that is the complaint. But here's the trust. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. So this is David trusting in God. Um, I, he, he continues to trust in God. I lie down and sleep. I woke again. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. So he gets a good night's sleep despite... Um, despite the trouble, because he trusts in God. I will not fear though tens of thousands assail me on every side. I will still sleep 
and I will wake up again. The Lord sustain me, I will not fear. So he's expressing trust. And then he's calling God for deliverance. Arise, Lord, deliver me from deliver, deliver me, my God. All right. Uh, strike me, strike all my enemies on the jaw, break the teeth of the wicked. Then there's a, he has the assurance that God will indeed deliver him. From the Lord comes deliverance and then a bit, and then praise. May your blessing be on your people. So uh, this is this this particular psalm, Psalm 3, follows the format to the T, all right? And this is the first of the Psalm of David, which is a psalm of individual lament. And of course, then you can then appropriate. Uh, this is when he fled from his son, Absalom. So one of the great things about Psalms of David is that the situation is, is usually super extreme. So if you think that, so that if, a, if an ordinary Israelite is having some problems, right? And he's like angry and upset and scared and have to um and want to sing a psalm. They can always sing a psalm of their king, King David. And when they recognize that their king had gone through worse, you have to flee from your own son Absalom. And then you realize that okay, my my life is not as hard as the king's life in this regard. Okay. And if the king went through it, so can I. And this is what the king prayed during his time of trouble. And I can basically follow the same. I can just I can just either sing it as it is, right? Because that's how, that's what we do, right? When we're feeling down, when we're feeling sad, so we sing a song with songs that we can remember. Yeah. Which is probably why um there's so many lament psalms because we sing these psalms when we're sad. We sing songs when we're sad, right? Um, there's some there's more reason to sing. And 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 uh this is a lament psalm. There's a format to it. Address, complain, trust, deliverance, assurance, and praise. So uh here's another one. Uh I'll give us an example. Thanksgiving. Uh so Thanksgiving, the format is you start with an address and then you tell what was what was your distress and then you appeal to God and God saves you and so now you want to give your testimony. So Thanksgiving is usually public. <clears throat> Although this is an individual Thanksgiving, it is an individual showing up to the temple to offer up the Thanksgiving sacrifice. So when you go to the temple, you offer up Thanksgiving sacrifice. You don't just bring the animal, right? There is some there's a service, right? There is a there is there is a worship service that accompanies it. So you want to give thanks to God, you 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 make your appointment, you bring the animal, and then you you can select a song uh, that most that most um resonate with your situation. And maybe Psalm 116 resonates best with your situation. Uh and all thanksgiving, you give thanks because something bad happened and then God saved you, right? So therefore the format is quite standard. Addressing, giving it, giving an address and then um, tell us what your problem was and then how you cried out to God and then how God saved you and that is why you came here to the temple to offer sacrifice today. Uh, this, this, is a good, this is a good format for uh, giving testimony of thanksgiving during open worship. I'm serious, all right. If you want to enrich your uh, uh contribution to open worship, uh, this this is a good format to follow. I love the Lord for He heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy because I turned, because He turned His ear to me. I will call on Him as long as I live. So that is the address. All right. You are you are you are in this case you're actually addressing the people. You're addressing the people who are who are witnessing your sacrifice. That can be your family, the priest, and anyone who's around the congregation. So you, then you explain your distress. The, the cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. Maybe you can have COVID or something like that, right? So you feel like dying. And so I, I was overcome by distress and sorrow. You felt like you were about to die. And then, so there's a distress. So you appeal to God. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. So that is your appeal. And then here is a description of the deliverance. 
The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For the Lord, for you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. So it was a near death experience, I guess. Uh, he was very, very sick. The, and so I guess this is a good hymn to give thanks to the Lord after you recover from a major illness. So that's a deliverance. And then here's the testimony that you want to tell the people who are assembled uh, for, for the sacrifice. I trusted in the Lord when I said I'm greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said, everyone's a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious is the sight of the Lord, is the death in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servant. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord. That is basically the free will offering, the vow offering, all of that, the thanksgiving offering. In the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in the midst, in your midst, Jerusalem. So he, so he's actually in the temple, uh, saying all these things, right? So this is a temple psalm. Psalm one one six is part of that collection of book five, right? It's a book five collection. You know what I mean? It's a book five for collection. You're coming back from exile, and then we want to make sure that we have a, 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 a psalm for every situation for people to select from when they come to the temple to worship God. And so this this psalm is, is does that function? Okay. It ends with hallelujah at the end. Praise the Lord. Yeah. So uh, this is a Thanksgiving psalm. Uh, the next psalm, Psalm 117, is the shortest psalm. And I want to uh, close the section on psalms with, with this one. Then we'll take a break. Uh, psalm 117 is the shortest psalm. Uh, and I want to use it to do some teaching on how to read a psalm. First of all, there is this thing called uh, parallelism. Parallelism. One of the things that uh that marks out a a poor poetry Hebrew poetry for English poetry for example usually classically poetry is poetry if the language is more elevated poetry is poetry if uh there is the the phrasing of it and of course rhyme for English we want the rhyme we want the 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 rhythm okay so if you're writing an iambic pentameter. So you go da-dum, 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 da-dum. You know what I mean? Da-dum, right? So that would be an iambic pentameter. Da-dum, 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 da-dum. So, uh, and then the next line, da-dum, 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 da-dum. And somehow it must rhyme. So that would be um, classically what an English uh, 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 poetry would look like. So Hebrew poetry is characterized by 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 symmetry and the kind of symmetry we're looking at is called parallelism which is one line is paralleled by the next line so for example here we have praise the lord okay so we have praise and then we have the lord all right praise who praise the lord and if you can just connect praise the lord and this is paralleled by extol all right, him. Okay, extol him. So this is a parallel. So then you have all you, all right, all you nations paralleled by all you peoples. So basically, it is uh, saying the same thing twice, <laughs> more or less, right? You know what I mean? Okay, so praise the Lord, all, all your nations. Extol him, all you peoples. Um, perhaps this could be recited antiphonally. That means I say one line, you say one line kind of a thing, right? So maybe the leader will say, praise the Lord, all you nations. And then everybody respond with extol him, all you peoples, that kind of a thing, right? So, so that is how it, it's helpful. And then we have, for great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Now, this, this, this structure 
it, so here we have what we call parallelism, parallelism, this parallelism. And here we have something that can be called um, a chiasm, whereby I will just, I'll just highlight, okay, great. Okay, great. And I'm going to, how great? Forever. Forever. Okay. His love. So let's have. His love. Okay. And it is paralleled by faithfulness of the Lord. Okay, great is paralleled by endures forever. It's an explanation of how great it is. Then his love is paralleled by faithfulness of the Lord. And then in the middle, it is, uh, let's have this color, toward us, toward us. All right. So therefore, if I if I can 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 write you can you can see that blue on the outside, purple on the inside, and uh red in the middle. So this is called a chiasm, whereby you have something up here, something up here, down there, and then I have purple, purple. And then we have uh, red in the middle here, right? Great is his love toward us. The faithfulness of the Lord endures forever, right? So this is called a, a chiasm. Um, so this is A, B, C, B prime and A prime, like that, okay? And you can see that the emphasis here is toward us. <clears throat> this, this is the goal, toward us, all right? Toward us. <clears throat> why, 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 why do we praise the Lord? Why do we extol him? For great is his love toward us. The faithfulness of the Lord endures forever toward us, all right? So that is that is the 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 way that the the psalm is designed. So the more you understand Hebrew parallelism, so I will I I do actually encourage you when you read the Psalms or Hebrew poetry to just print it out on a A4 paper with generous margin and then just take out color pencils and start coloring. Okay. Uh start coloring and you and then you'll see amazing ama amazing things. All right. A any questions before we take a break? All right. Let's take a 10 minutes break.
It's so funny. You know, it's, it's so funny, and then all of a sudden it became like that.
right now uh we continue with <clears throat> um with wisdom literature wisdom literature so there are three books that are um there's also song of songs but these three are generally the wisdom literature that is talk together they usually they, they come together to, to be read together proverbs job and ecclesiastes so um proverbs one the famous verse the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom um it reads with <clears throat> um how do i say this um normative wisdom you will have things like better is a dry muscle with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. A servant who deals wisely will rule over a son who acts shamefully and will share the inheritance as one of the brothers, right? Um, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. So it's full of these sayings. A wise son hears his father's instruction but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. Um, whoever is wicked covets the spoils of evildoers, but the root of the righteous bears fruit. And it really sounds like the kind of things that we we, we hear um, uh, often, right? Like, for example, uh, what, what our grandparents uh, will, will say, uh, early bird gets the worm, etc. That, that, kind of that kind of a thing. And... And so, uh, the way to read this type of literature is, uh, is to read them as normative wisdom. That is, normally, if the early bird, it, normally it is the early bird that gets the worm, right? Um, it is not a promise. The, your, your grandparents, when they are telling you these aphorisms, this words of wisdom it's a word of wisdom it is not a promise by your grandparent that if you if you go if you if you are an early bird you will get the worm uh sometimes that doesn't happen and when that doesn't happen you go why why didn't it happen uh i was the early bird how come i didn't get the worm is the is the is the um late bird that 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 um uh that, that, that got the worm, not me. And such is the reality of life. But generally, uh, the early bird gets the worm, right? And generally, this is good advice. And so the Proverbs is full of uh, these kind of things that if you follow its teaching, for example, chapter 3, verse 1, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and life and years of life and peace they will add to you. So um, it doesn't mean if your days are shortened uh, that you, you, you die early. Uh, it doesn't mean it is because you did not remember the teachings of Proverbs. Not necessarily the case. But you can imagine if a person would... Uh, follow the teachings of Proverbs, then chances are they will live longer um, uh, and, and, and more peacefully than someone who does not, right? So it is a general normative wisdom. And this is very good to teach young people, right? So people will say this is like a school, Proverbs is like a school teacher teaching a, a young person of how to live growing up there's two ways to live there is the righteous way of living and that is the evil way of living and if you live righteously you will reap a uh, righteous reward and if you live wickedly then you will suffer loss um that's usually what happens but then by the time you hit 30 something 40 years old and you begin to suffer things that doesn't make sense. And, and you need something more than Proverbs 
that gives you normative wisdom. It is about what happened when bad things happen to good people. Um, and that is the book of Job. And the book of Job says sometimes the righteous suffer. Well, what's the answer to that? Uh, because if you follow the book of Proverbs, you may get the impression that the righteous do not suffer. Only the wicked will suffer. And if I have done everything according to the book of Job, uh, according to the book of Proverbs, I ought to prosper. And, and, and Job was suffering, and his friends were saying, you, that's because you have abandoned the teachings of the book of Proverbs. Basically something like that, right? You have abandoned the teachings of the book of of Proverbs. And and, and that is why you are suffering. If if you really follow God's wisdom, then you you will not suffer the way that you do. God will not allow it. And that's not true. And that that in itself, the book of Job in itself ought to tell us that the book of Proverbs is not a book of promises. A lot of people uh, mistakenly read the book of Proverbs thinking that these are promises by God. If I do X, then I will get Y. If I do X, then I will get Y. Kind of a thing. It can result in some kind of a prosperity gospel. Um, the name it and claim it kind of a phenomena. I, I name a proverb and I claim the proverb. That's not how it works. All right. Um, so sometimes the righteous suffer. And the book of Job says God has a good reason for the suffering of the innocent. Even if we do not know the reason, we can trust in God that he has a good reason. So then, uh, so some, 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 some commentators like to talk about, you know, if Proverbs is for someone in the young age to learn the way of life, to learn how to do good, to learn how to follow the Lord, to learn how to live in in a in a way that is wise, to have the fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom, normative wisdom. That, that is very good teaching for young people. And then for those in the middle age, then you know you 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 just know that God has a reason uh, for your suffering. Your suffering is not in vain. And then comes Ecclesiastes when you're in your old age. I suppose, uh, according to some commentators, it reads that way. Uh, and, and you go, vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. That life is inscrutable. There is just no rhyme or reason for whatever that happens. Good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. Nothing happened to these people. A lot of things happen to whatever. And then at the end, we all die. And then what's the point? Right. So that's how, that's how Ecclesiastes goes. Ecclesiastes goes, um, yeah, good things happen to good people sometimes. Bad things happen to bad people sometimes. Good things happen to bad people sometimes. Bad things happen to good people sometimes. Who knows why? There's no reason why. Maybe God has an answer. Maybe God doesn't have an answer. It doesn't. It doesn't really matter. Uh, because you can't find out anyways. And whether you're good, whether you're bad, whether you're this, whether you're that, whether you have a lot, whether you have a little. At the end, you all we die. And so when we die, then that, that's just the end. You finish. Okay. So basically, it it is it is um uh, uh rather dark, isn't it? The way that that uh, uh Ecclesiastes ends. So Proverbs, Job, and Ecclesiastes um are are these true co 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 together? They are the wisdom literature. But Ecclesiastes ends <clears throat> with this idea that <clears throat> our job here it is still to keep the commandments of God because God will bring into judgment everything will bring into judgment, meaning to say that maybe death <clears throat> is not the end of everything. The end of the matter, all has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of men. For God will bring every deed into judgment, every secret evil, every secret thing, whether good or evil. So the idea that God will one day bring every deed into judgment actually brings hope. Uh, verse 14, really, God will bring every deed into judgment is the only hope that is provided 
in the book of Ecclesiastes. And so finally, in order to know what is true wisdom, we have to go to the New Testament, where Jesus again presents us two ways to live. Those who hear his voice and uh, listens and obeys is like someone who builds his house on a rock with foundation. And so when the wind blows and um, it doesn't collapse. But the person who hears the word of Jesus but doesn't do what it say what he says is like someone who builds his house on the sand. And when the wind blows, the the waves come, um, it will collapse. Uh, Jesus will say, enter in through the narrow gate. Uh, fill of, it leads to eternal life. We will find it the narrow gate, the constricted path. But the wide, the broad one, the highway, many will go through it and and go into perdition. And so, and so Jesus then okay gives this new normative wisdom that is about eternal life. It is about what do you do with Jesus uh, if you follow him, if you give your life to him, then you will have eternal life. But if you do not, then even if you gain the whole world, what advantage is that to you? Because at the end you die. And that is in part answering Ecclesiastes. Uh, Jesus is a, a great Ecclesiastes is that <clears throat> if you gain the whole world, what advantage, what profit does it give a man? And that's exactly what Ecclesiastes says. What profit does it give a man if he gains the whole world? Because in the end you die. So therefore, is there a path out of death? And the answer is yes. The answer is resurrection. And Jesus then shows that there is resurrection after death by rising from the dead. And so there is, so wisdom makes sense again. So Proverbs tells us that wisdom makes sense. Living wisely makes sense. <clears throat> uh, Job says, well, you know, sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. Ecclesiastes says this whole thing is doesn't make sense. All right, there's no such thing as wisdom, anyways. What is it for? At the end, we all die, and and that is because we all die, which means that because we will all die, and 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 if death is the end of everything, then it really doesn't matter. Really, frankly speaking, <clears throat> if death ends everything, then frankly speaking, it doesn't matter whether there's an up, whether there's a down whether there's a left, there's a right, there's side to side. It doesn't matter because we all die. You do right, you die. You do bad, you die. So uh, what difference does it make? <clears throat> uh, it, it has, there is no profit. This whole wisdom enterprise is for no reason um, because life is just inscrutable. But if there is actually eternal life, there is actually judgment, uh, there is actually the resurrection, then how you live really matters. Then there is the necessity to live wisely and the way to live is to have the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All right, And that is how you read uh, wisdom literature, Proverbs, Job, and Ecclesiastes. <clears throat> All right. So let's let's uh, have 15 minutes of uh, Q&A, question and answer, discussion time, anything you want to share um, before we, we close out. Uh, next week, we will not have <clears throat> CEP because next week there is the, um, what is the next week? Leaders meeting. Uh, next week, there is the, the leaders, leaders me meeting. Yeah, three leaders meeting. And and so we will come back uh, the following week on the 22nd of June to do the book of Revelation and Conclusion. And then we'll take a break in July. We will come back with uh with with uh, an overview of the Old Testament. Okay, so let's let's have uh, some sharings. Any questions? Psalms wisdom. I remember someone saying we can't take the book of Proverbs as a book of promises. Yeah, we can't. 
It's not. It's a book of normative wisdom. Like as how you came back after saying all that you said, and then you went back to Proverbs. Um, so it is it is advantageous to live wisely. It is advantageous because there is eternal life. <clears throat> if there is no eternal life, then that it really doesn't. <laughs> what, what what nothing actually matters. You think about it, right? right. If there's no eternal life, mm -hmm. uh, we live, we die. There's no accounting. Then what what is there? There's nothing, right? The righteous die. The wicked die. Yeah. But it's so much um, what a lot of people say nowadays that, you know, live because there's no life after that. I mean, very mm. few believe. Or if they do believe, then it's like um, in some faiths, you, you, you reincarnate uh, and become something. something but that is still life after that. Yes, but they don't pay too much attention to it and they don't want to think about sin. Um, well, so they think so much about it that they become monks. Huh? Pardon? Some think so much about it that they end up becoming monks. But if that is the basis of hope, then you can see that how that is actually a, a very sad... Um, Thing, right because um, if someone is suffering <clears throat> unjustly uh, you don't want to help because that person is paying for his karma and if you help him and he or she ended up not paying that karma because you took that away from her then she will have to suffer this again in the, in the next life Don't know fully their teaching, but just a little bit to me, yeah. Thank you for connecting uh, Living Wisely with the story of, uh, of how Jesus says that we need to listen to him and obey him like the wise man. Thank you yeah. for that connection. Yeah. I, yeah. I, Jesus is a teacher of wisdom. Thank you so much, uh, Gamit. Well, uh, William, have anything to share? Oh, just want to ask, ask one question. Mm -hmm. Just curious. Lah. Um, is there a place for pulpit uh, ministry um, based on the book of Proverbs? I think we have not covered now because obviously in our church. But do you see that uh, as a necessity? Uh, well, it depends on how, how you do it. I'm not sure you can do much Topical expository, line. chapter by chapter expository of, of Proverbs. Um, uh, it's probably not compiled for that purpose. Hmm. Yeah, but can you approach it uh, like on mm. a topical, uh, uh, on a topical, yeah, them on a topical, you know, like yeah. handling finance, yeah, yeah, like, you no know, bringing up children, yeah, you know, fearing the Lord, you know, which is yeah. you know, yeah, some, some of these topics can can be used to yeah to teach, yeah, but for expository preaching on proverbs, I yeah. I, I find it a uh, bit difficult, I yeah, I don't think so, the other one, yeah, yeah, I guess it gets repetitive after a while if you uh, if you do it chapter by chapter. Ah, uh, yes, the one again. Yeah, topical begin. Hi, Stephen. I just Hi, want to share that uh, when when I was growing up, young Christians, I find it so helpful to use the Psalms as devotion. Mm. And and then I read. Oh, I can't remember whether it was Billy Graham. He said he read one chapter of Proverbs a day. Mm. I can't remember one of the men and then five chapters of Psalms. Mm. That means you can cover the two books in one month. 
And that time also I was reading like First Samuel. It's just gel in to see the background of David and Saul and, and then the it was so enriching as a, I mean spiritually, yeah. Just mm. like it's a wonderful experience. Right. Uh if you read one chapter of Proverbs uh every day, then you can cover it in a month. Uh Psalms, if you read five you will um psalms yeah so, yeah i i believe that you might have to break some one night into half and some psalms are shorter than than, than others so slightly more than a, um, a month yeah you're right so I, and also that i think that person i can't remember was Graham as well, because psalms teaches us how to relate to god and proverbs teaches us how to relate to men, our fellow men. So it's so enriching, actually. Uh, okay, yeah. right. Thank you so much for that sharing. Uh, now, Tuan, I can see that you are, you are uh, engaged. You're talking to me. Uh, yeah, yeah, your camera is on, so you have anything to share? Yeah, I, I'm very quiet in this group. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I actually love Psalms a lot, lah. Mm. Like, like what see, I say, uh, it relates our relationship to God, and you see how David actually expressed that through his ups and downs, and how he cried to God, and God answered him. I I think it's uh one of the most beautiful um uh chapters in God's um, Bible, lah. I, I wonder why he gave it to us, all the songs. Oh, uh, so that we know how to pray. So that we have the language for prayer. The language of prayer. Mm. Because I'm not eloquent in prayer, so always I keep very shy. But I uh, worry when I say things out loud in front of others, it mm. say the wrong things. La. Yeah. Mm. So... Does it mean like using the psalms to pray? Is it a good way to to strengthen my prayer? Oh, absolutely, yes, yes. But there are some psalms that you know that the um when you, for example, when you read when when you pray the psalms of a suffering servant, at some point, as there may, there may be some points that you you feel that ah, I can't actually pray it because it is too righteous. For example, it says, judge me according to my righteousness. Right? Then you say, ah, there's no way I can say that. Judge me according to my righteousness. And then you begin to realize there is somebody who actually can say that. That is Jesus. He really is the suffering servant, the suffering innocent. Then you begin to realize that, ah, actually, these Psalms are about our Lord, uh, ultimately about our Lord. And so when you then read those Psalms, and pray those psalms in that context that these psalms are all fulfilled in Jesus Christ, then you know it will also strengthen your understanding of the heart of God. Because at times I want to get right with God because I think sometimes my conscience say I'm doing things that are not right. Right. So I can't find the verses that um from a lot of the other chapters. I find psalms. Uh, it's more soothing and more mm. like, sing to the soul. Uh. Yeah, 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 that's what I felt. Yeah, yeah. Psalm, <clears throat> Psalm 51, for example, uh, mm. will be that Psalm of Repentance. So, <clears throat> yeah, very good. Thank you so much you. for sharing. Okay. Is that it? <clears throat> If that's it, then I think we can close today's uh, session. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you that you have given us time to come together, even on Zoom, to learn your word here this time on Psalms and also wisdom literature, Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes. I pray, Lord, that uh, nothing that uh, we learn will ever go in vain because you promised that your word will never go in vain, but will always accomplish its purposes. So I pray, Lord, as you grant us the 
wisdom to and the love for your word. Uh, I pray that you continually remind us the purpose of why you give us your word so that we may know you and be transformed more and more like unto your son, Jesus Christ. So Lord, renew our hearts, renew our minds day by day. Even as we go through life, Lord, I ask that you will constantly remind us from your word, uh, from the Bible, of your teaching and of your love for us and of our loyalty to you. So Lord Jesus, send us forth from this meeting with your presence and with your peace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.